Hello, my name is Victoria Chrisman. I'm a historian and I teach in the interdisciplinary international studies major here at Luther College in Decorah, Iowa. I also direct our Center for Ethics and Public Engagement, which has been running a series of faculty focus videos centered on the COVID-19 pandemic. So we've asked various faculty to give a little lecture um, explaining how their particular discipline explains and understands the COVID-19 pandemic. I am actually not going to be doing that in this little video. This is more of a public service announcement video to explain the work of the World Health Organization. But if you're interested in a longer lecture um, on disciplinary understandings of COVID-19, then check out our webpage at cepe.luther.edu and you will find more videos there. And for those of you who have reached this page, having done a Google search for the WHO and are looking for Roger Daltrey, I apologize that he will not be appearing, more's the pity. Instead, I will be discussing what is the World Health Organization and how does it function, given that it has been in the news in the past few days. So who is the who? The WHO is a specialized agency, that's its official designation of the United Nations. There are many of these specialized agencies, many, most of which you probably will recognize, like UNESCO, which is the Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization of the UN, or UNICEF, the International Children's Emergency Fund of the United Nations. So the WHO is the World Health Organization, which acts in concert with the United Nations, but is not part of the core body of the United Nations. It does, however, contain 194 member states. So 194 actors, state actors, consider themselves members of the WHO. It is headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, but has six regional offices spread throughout the, the world, and then 150 field offices in places in which it's most active. So that's how it looks. It was founded on the 7th of April, 1948, in the wake of the, seven, uh, the Second World War, um, on a day that we now consider and celebrate as World Health Day. Uh, it's a body that grew out of the League of Nations, which is true of many of the UN uh, bodies and subsidiaries. And in the years since 1948, it has forged many uh, associations with NGOs from across the world. So it's now a large, complex, many-membered organization. The best way to figure out what the WHO does and believes is to take a quick look at its mission and constitution. Its constitution is long, <laughs> so we're just going to pick out a couple of highlights in this short video, lest this continue for weeks. So the first place to look is the preamble, and this gives us a good understanding of how the WHO defines health. And it defines it this way, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So this signals right away that the WHO sees health not just as a medical condition, but as a holistic condition of the entire person. It's medical, it's mental, it's physical. It involves the whole person. They also claim that unequal development in different countries in the promotion of health and the control of diseases, um, especially communicable diseases, is a common danger. And again, this is a holistic view this time of the world, right? That in less developed, poorer countries, the inability to contain their health problems becomes a problem for the entire world. So the WHO is taking a bird's eye view of global health, of public health on a global stage, and is interested in promoting it across the board. Their first article explains their key objective, which is that the WHO, the objective of the WHO should be the attainment by all peoples of the highest possible level of health. That possibility will be different in different locations, 
but their clear goal is to help people achieve the highest possible level of health that they are able. And its role is the directing and um, the directing and coordinating authority to be the directing and coordinating authority on international health work. So in any situation in which bodies from across the world come together to promote public health, the WHO seeks to coordinate um, and direct that work. So it's an authority and it's also a helper in those situations. Its focus is most publicly perhaps on communicable diseases, uh, such as in the recent past, the fight against tuberculosis, against malaria, smallpox, which was declared to be eradicated many years ago, polio, which has come close to being eradicated, but we're still fighting against, um, measles, AIDS, um, all of the most heavy hitting uh, communicable diseases that we're all aware of. So they're very involved in the fight against all of those diseases across the globe. But they also work on non-communicable diseases, such as um, situations arising from poor environmental conditions that create pollution that affects public health, sexual and reproductive health around the world, food safety and security, which also impacts health, sustainable development for the same reasons and emergency responses to health crises such as the one that we are in in the moment. So what does the leadership structure of the WHO look like? Um, at the top of the leadership hierarchy of the WHO is the secretariat and this is basically the director general and his or her staff. At the moment his, in the past hers, um, that's the highest level, the, the leadership of the WHO, and underneath that person is the executive board. And this is comprised of 35 people, regionally dispersed, drawn from a regional dis distribution, and they meet two times a year. And their job is to put into action the policies and decisions that are made by the World Health Assembly. This is a larger body composed of representatives from all 194 member states. And they meet annually plus. So they have an annual session and then they'll call special sessions and they make decisions and um, policies that then get executed by the executive board. So that's how the WHO is structured, it has its own independent structure and it also has its own independent funding, its own budget. Its budget runs somewhere in excess of $4 billion. Um, and it is drawn in two kinds. It's drawn by assessed funding and voluntary funding. So each member state is assessed a certain amount of contribution based on its population, its ability to pay, um, and then on top of that, many states um, contribute voluntary amounts of money as well. The US is and has been the highest contributing member state. So in the current budget, budget cycle, the US is expected to contribute in excess of $400 million to that $4 billion overall budget, which is no small percentage. Um, other states contribute also and some robustly and also some foundations uh, and non-governmental bodies contribute to for example the bill and melinda gates foundation is heavily involved financially with the work of the world health organization so that's how the budgeting of it goes um, our the reason for this video is that the who has been in the news because the current administration is threatening to cut the u.s funding which based on the figures I just showed you, um, is, would clearly be a significant cut in funding. Um, the w, this is not the first time that the US or others have critiqued the WHO. Uh, this time, the criticism is about its relationship with China and its uh, acceptance of information from China at the beginning of the COVID crisis. Other complaints are similar to those leveled at all international agencies, the UN included, um, and they usually involve three issues. Issues of sovereignty, and I would say 
a current issue is one of these, right? That um, an international body that seeks to advise and direct action on individual state actors is in a tug of war over the sovereignty of those states. It's a dance, right, between what the international community advises through the WHO and what individual nations are willing to do, in this case, China. And the dance on the part of the WHO is that if they anger China, if their diplomacy fails, then China may withhold all information. And that might be more dangerous on a public health level than if China gives in, in complete information, right? So the WHO is engaged in this dance with China and it's their um, execution of that dance that is currently under question. Other uh, foundations of critique uh, of the WHO and the UN usually involve bureaucratic issues. These bodies are huge and their mandates have expanded enormously over their founding visions in 1948. Um, and the bureaucracy causes problems sometimes. So that is also a locus of complaint, as is competing economic and political visions and ideologies. If you have 194 nations sitting around a table, they're not going to agree on <laughs> all economic and political strategies. Uh, and we see this even within our own country at the moment. The US is wrestling with itself about what is more important, the economic catastrophe of COVID-19 or the public health catastrophe. And we're seeing figures compared and we're trying to decide if we open up communities again and take that risk. So you see there playing out differences in political and uh, economic understandings and differences in understandings of the weight given to those different uh, visions of the world. So all of these are critiques that are not uncommon um, from countries to the work of the WHO, although withdrawing funding altogether on the basis of those critiques is, has been, is rare. Um, and the WHO is praised uh, as well many times. For example, in the SARS outbreak in 2003, which also involved China, um, most nations pr highly praised the work of the WHO in that crisis. They were critiqued for their work on the Ebola crisis in Africa in 2015, but made improvements in their emergency response, which seems to have helped in the way they handled the Ebola crisis in the Congo more recently. So it, this is a constant shifting ground, right, of critique and amendment and, um, and the work that they are able to do. The current question about whether or not uh, the US will withdraw funding has been bubbling a little bit in the current administration's work over the last few years. So in 2017, uh, when President Trump first took office, he was interested in reducing by about 40% the commitment of the US to many international organizations and, and proposed that as a budget cut. In the next year, when he lodged his federal budget request, it included about a third, a cut of about one third in the funding of State Department initiatives that would have included the WHO within that um, packet. And then in the budget requests of 2019, 20, and now 21, he has suggested a 50% cut in those budgets and specifically in the budget of the WHO. So before the COVID-19 crisis, Already, he was seeking to sort of uncouple our budget from contributions, such large contributions to the World Health Organization. The critique on the other side, of course, is that it might be dangerous to do that in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. Um, and how that plays out remains to be seen and is not the subject of this little mini video. But if you have questions that are not answered by this sort of brief sketch of how the WHO works, feel free to uh, add them in the comment section under YouTube. And maybe in the future, when we see how the dust settles on this decision, we can do a more full length lecture and discuss all of those. Thanks.